Uh, I'd like to invite now Dr. David Greenfield to speak on OCT for diagnosis and progression. Dr. Greenfield is professor of ophthalmology at Bascom Palmer in Florida. Gus, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to the program organizers for including me. Uh, and what an outstanding venue to be in, the New York Bar. You know, normally as doctors, we do anything we can to avoid being close to attorneys. And looking straight in front of me is the notorious RBG, and below me is a sign saying that attorneys sometimes need to be aggressive in their behavior. So what a daunting venue. Uh, I'll, I'll be discussing OCT for glaucoma diagnosis and glaucoma progression, and I have no disclosures. Uh, it's great to be back in New York as a fellow New Yorker. When I was starting my career in glaucoma after completing my fellowships in Miami, I had the great pleasure of uh, joining Jeff Liebman and Bob Rich in practice at New York Eye and Ear. And uh, my office was right outside the misspelled Ocular Imaging Center. And what a great time to be involved in glaucoma. 1995, uh, most of these tools were considered research only tools. There was no reimbursement code for performing imaging. Uh, what kind of technologies were available? Well, we were uh, using the confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope embodied in the Heidelberg technology developed in Bob Weinreb's laboratory. We were using scanning laser polarimetry embodied in the GDX developed in Bob Weinreb's laboratory. We were using a beta type of optical coherence tomography uh, developed in Boston. Uh, the retinal thickness analyzer and some other uh, investigative technologies. We were studying these technologies for diagnosing glaucoma early, uh, not really for detecting progression or using them in any of the ways that we use them nowadays. How do we use them? Well, we can predict progression. We can uh, stage the severity of glaucoma. We can uh, uh, diagnose glaucoma at the earliest stages, and of course we can monitor progression. And here is an example in which we needed some objective technologies that were reliable and reproducible to help see uh, glaucoma at its earliest stage. Like in this particular eye, the optic nerve is rather small, the vertical diameter is smaller than 1.8 millimeters, so rather small disc. Uh, with a clearly defined retinal nerve fiber layer defect that all of us can see in this rather young individual. We know it's a real retinal nerve fiber layer defect. It's wider than a retina vein. It uh, is confluent with the edge of the optic nerve. I don't think any of us would miss that, but is this glaucoma? Of course it is. The, the nerve is rather small. There's no appreciable cupping. There's no focal loss in the integrity of the neural rim. Um, but this is glaucoma, and now it's great to have objective technology to help uh, detect and monitor and uh, detect changes in these patients over time. So one of the critical values for these technologies, of course, is in early diagnosis, uh, selective perimetry using uh, short wavelength perimetry and frequency doubling technology was available. Uh, and the visual field uh, that, that Jeff just talked about, completely normal. Clearly, we can see that uh, using this platform uh, of OCT technology uh, with the OptiView, clearly there's diffuse retinal nerve fiber layer atrophy, uh, both around the peripapillary region as well as in the central fovea. So, uh, of course, all technologies have false positives uh, and false negatives. Here's an example of a patient with very labile blood pressure, very brittle blood pressure, clearly defined hypertensive retinopathy. The optic nerve is normal for all intents and purposes. There is no focal loss of the uh, neural rim. The visual field using white on white perimetry, completely normal. Um, and you can see that there is diffuse atrophy of the surrounding peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, not due to glaucoma. This patient has always had normal intraocular pressure uh, and the optic disc is normal. It's a false positive because of their uh, severe vasculopathy. There's also false negatives. And here's a patient with obvious glaucomatous changes in the optic nerve, rather severe optic nerve damage. 
uh, and visual field loss in both the upper as well as the lower hemi field, and uh, no detectable changes uh, in the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer. I would look at that and probably give it a pass if I didn't know what the optic nerve looked like. So clear value in uh, detecting glaucoma at all stages, uh, and OCT has really been a, a tremendous, tremendous way to objectively measure structural changes in eyes with glaucoma. What about glaucoma progression? Um, and uh, we know if you use ICD staging uh, characteristics, uh, that early glaucoma is defined by a characteristically normal white-on-white -white visual field. So if you want to follow changes in the ICD stage of glaucoma at its earliest stage, where the visual field is normal, and I would also say normal in the central as well as in the 24-2 uh, peripheral visual field, <clears throat> you have to rely on structural changes for detecting further changes, and that's with either imaging or optic nerve photography. Yet in eyes with more severe stages of glaucoma, uh, photography plays less of a useful role, and imaging and perimetry play much more of an important role in detecting further changes. As we approach more severe stages of glaucoma, we tend to rely more on visual field changes, but I think as we all now know that imaging also will play an important role in detecting focal changes, even in eyes with severe glaucoma. And by that, I mean not only in the uh, peripapillar nerve fiber layer, but also in the ganglion cell layer, looking for changes over time as well. Again, I have no disclosures. I happen to use the Zeiss platform uh, in my clinical practice. So I'll talk a little bit about some basic concepts on how I judge progression, uh, structural progression in my patients. I, I use both the optic nerve as well as the macular cube programs. Jeff mentioned that with visual fields, you need a minimum of five visual fields to compare changes over time. And with OCT, the guided progression analysis software can detect changes using four uh, changes, two baselines and two follow-up images. Quality control is paramount, and it's important to detect any abnormalities, uh, such as uh, poor signal strength, and we use a minimum of six uh, using the Zeiss platform. But there's lots of other types of uh, artifacts that you have to be careful to avoid, including motion artifact, blocking ad artifact, myopic changes, and so on and so forth. What's considered progression? There are a number of ways to use imaging to detect progression. One way is to look at the RNFL map using guided progression analysis and likely progression is uh, when one sees 20 contiguous superpixels changing on the optic nerve scan or 10 contiguous superpixels on the ganglion cell IPL uh, GPA analysis. Here's an example of uh, the RNFL progression. There are multiple ways, as I mentioned, to look for change, including the maps, uh, as well as rates and uh, typical loss due to aging in the average retinal nerve fiber is about a half micron per year. Glaucomatous change uh, is double that, uh, an average of loss in the average RNFL of about one micron uh, per year um, might highlight an eye at risk for glaucoma progression, but rates can be measured just like with visual fields. And there are summary parameters as well that look at not just the changes in the rates and the maps, but also changes uh, in other parameters uh, that might indicate suspicion for progression. The same types of analyses are available for the GCIPL, the maps, the rates, the summary parameters. I will highlight, though, that these are more susceptible to artifacts. Lots of patients with glaucoma have comorbid maculopathy, macular puckers, macular degeneration, and so on and so forth. And you have to be much more careful about using these macular maps due to their higher proportion of artifact that can impact uh, your interpretation. We like to see structure function agreement when assessing progression. Here's an eye with severe glaucoma. I'm also highlighting a panoramic map, which incorporates both the macula as well as the optic nerve in one map. 
Uh, and there's clearly uh, rather rapid progression in this eye now involving both the upper and the lower hemifields. And when one looks at the changes over time in the optic nerve and in the macula, you see rather good agreement. That's helpful. That's not always the case. And there are a lot of reasons for why one might just see changes in visual fields, but not in the uh, imaging scans over time. But one of the beauties of both having our visual fields and our OCT images is that they have been rather stable over time. You haven't seen a ton of changes in these technologies, making them both backwards compatible and very useful for following patients over the long term. Uh, you have to be careful, not only for the presence of artifact, but in eyes with very severe damage, it's very difficult to interpret changes over time. We're all very familiar with the fact that uh, there is a measurement floor in, uh, in eyes when looking at the visual field, there's a measurement floor when uh, interpreting these scans. And that once the average RNFL reaches about 50 microns, or the macular average thickness is about 25 microns, well, we've reached the ability to detect further change if you're using these average parameters and you have to be much more focused on small, subtle focal changes rather than large average changes. There's also a higher propensity of algorithm failure in eyes with severe damage, just like there's a high variability using perimetry to detect changes in visual fields in eyes with severe glaucoma. Another important concept, we know now that we have to adjust the visual field if we uh, surgically lower intraocular pressure, we reset the baseline and then we look for further changes. The same thing has to be done when using imaging. And here's a patient that underwent uh, trabeculectomy in 2012. Uh, and yet in 2013, 14, and 15, it looked like there was still progression. Was this patient really progressing even though the intraocular pressure was in the single digits? No. In fact, you have to correct for that new baseline after the trabeculectomy was, porn, was performed. And you can see, looking at the rates, that there was a rather stable uh, rate of change in 2012 moving forward. So in, uh, after correcting for the baseline in 2012, you can see that all those changes in suspected progression just virtually disappear on the uh, GPA change analysis map. So to summarize, OCT is an extremely helpful clinical tool in serving as an adjunct for both glaucoma diagnosis and monitoring. Uh, you need to follow both structure and functional changes over time. Uh, I find the guided progression analysis to be extremely useful in both the peripapillary optic nerve and the macular region, but one must be really careful uh, to be aware of the potential for not being able to detect changes due to severe damage and the floor effect, as well as algorithm failure. Thanks very much.